Good day, and welcome to the UFC 170 conference call. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I will be turning the call over to Dave Schaller. Please go ahead. Thank you, Whitney. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the UFC 170 media conference call. UFC 170, Rousey versus McMahon, takes place Saturday, February 22nd at the Mandalay Bay Event Center in Las Vegas. Live on pay-per-view, 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. A limited number of tickets are still available at Ticketmaster.com. Today on the call, we have world champion Ronda Rousey and her opponent, Sarah McMahon, former champion Rashad Evans, and his uh, opponent, Daniel Cormier. With me at this time, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. It's star one to participate, and we will wait for just one moment while we prioritize the call. If you'd like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star one on your telephone. And please make sure your mute button is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, that is star one to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to assemble the queue. And we'll take our first question from Matt Erickson with MMAJunkie.com. Hi, guys. Thanks a lot. Uh, Rashad, I'd like to start with you if I could, please. Um, you know, Daniel's weight cut has been basically the big topic of conversation with this fight, but but the other one has been that you guys are, are friendly and have been for a while, and he's up, looked up to you for a long time in the sport. Are you tired at this point of, of fighting guys you're friendly with? Is it much easier to fight guys that you're not friendly with? I've got to get you together. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not an easy fight to get up for. You know, I mean, when, you, when you're going for a fight, you, you kind of, you know, it, it, it's a professional thing, but at the same time, you, you kind of build a little bit of manufacture and possibly just be able to make it a fight. Hey, Rashad, would you mind re uh, repeating that last part? Your phone broke up just a little bit. Yeah, hold on one. Thanks, Dave. All right. Um, yeah, I was saying, uh, you know, what a fight. Uh, even, you know, um, it's a professional thing, but at the same time, you try to manufacture some kind of animosity to the person just to be able to still make it a fight. But uh, with somebody that you're cool with, you know, it's really hard to do that. But it's, it's been a challenge to just make him a, a bigger monster in my mind than I really feel, you know. So uh, that's the hardest part about fighting in front of Was it easier to do that this time around with the, with the jail fight, you know, in the, in the rearview mirror since you just had gone through well, it? Yeah, well, I haven't had done that having an experience before. I already know how to uh, mentally compartmentalize it and to be able to put it right where I need to put it in order to go out there and have a great performance. So I think I've done that. I think I've, I've, I've uh, you know, made up the biggest monster in my mind, um, made sure I, I did everything that I could to, to make sure I'm prepared for this fight. Thanks, Rashad. Uh, and then, Daniel, if I could uh, jump over to you real quick. In terms of the weight cut, where does this rank for you in terms of difficulty throughout your athletic career, not just in, in weight cuts, but in terms of, you know, overall preparation for any type of a, of a competition? Before I answer the question, I do want to point out that this isn't very important to Rashad. He's got us on his uh, earpiece. Can't even sit in the house and talk to us. That's kind of messed up, Rashad. But uh, in terms of weight management, it's been uh, it's been good. It hasn't, it hasn't been a weight cut. You know, I haven't had to cut weight. I just had to uh, manage my weight. And um, because I've done that, it, it hasn't been as difficult as I anticipated. I uh, I feel great. I feel healthy. My training has gone uh, as well as I could have imagined. And I'm just, I'm just ready to fight, man. You know, it's, uh, it's no more difficult than getting prepared to wrestle in front of 20,000 people in the NCAA finals or wrestle for an Olympic gold medal. So, uh, I've had to compete on a, a large stage before, and uh, it had different difficult circumstances. So this doesn't very, this doesn't uh, this isn't very different. And then have you been able to effectively put aside the friendship thing? And um, do you think because the the a lot of the focus has been on, on you dropping the two hundred five for the first time, does that help distract you from thinking about having to fight a friend? Well, I mean, you know, it's difficult because. You know, I, I met Rashad a long time ago, back in college, you know, and uh, I, I think I wrestled his roommate, and the guy wrestled me really close. He never let me live it down. And then, uh, you know, I've got pictures of Rashad cornering me in strike force. you know. So our relationship's a little, you know, it's a little different than 
if I had to fight someone else. But, you know, man, as a professional, you got to kind of put it to the side and just train. I think the one thing that Rashad and I have done to allow for us to prepare for each, each other uh, in the best way that we could is, is we've kind of distanced ourselves. You know, we haven't spoken for, for five, six weeks. You know, this is the first time I've heard his voice in a long time. We, we generally don't go that long without talking to each other. So um, I've done some things to make Rashad my, my, uh, my enemy for February 22nd. That was hard to do. I step on the, the treadmill to run, and I listen to the music that he comes to the cage to. Uh, I watch his fights different than I did before uh, because I have to make him something that he's never been to me, and that's uh, that that's my opponent and my my, uh, my enemy on February 22nd. All right, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Again, if you'd like to ask a question, it is star one, and we'll go to our next questioner, Heidi Fang with MMA Fight Corner. Hello. Thank you for the time. Uh, my first question is for Rhonda. You've said uh, that you've wanted to be able to continue to challenge yourself to stay at the championship level. Stylistically, Sarah comes in as a medalist in wrestling. You're obviously a medalist in judo. How much of a challenge does this present to you? I would say it's like an 8.75. I don't know how you really want me to gauge that. Um, it's a big challenge. It's the biggest one that I've had to this date. And... Uh, you know, I think uh, that the first time that this ever happened with being in the women's division is something amazing as well, showing how quickly the uh, the women's the division is progressing. You know, the the men they have had um, a lot of Olympians and um, you know Olympic uh, guys with Olympic backgrounds competing before, but um, this is the first time we've had two undefeated Olympic medalists fighting for a title and. Um, I think partly uh, it's a little bit good timing that the women's division is still developing, and so that me and Sarah could come into to MMA and go and fight for a title so soon. I think it would be a much uh, harder to do if, if we were going through guys in deeper divisions, and I think that's why it hasn't happened yet. And so I think um, that's one of the advantages to the divisions being uh, uh, not as deep as the men's is that we could really fast track this fight and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's, it's really unprecedented, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And everybody knows about what you can do with your ground game and the submissions. Uh, we've seen recently and read uh, that you've been taking out some boxing champions that you've been bringing in with body shots. What can you tell us about the development of your striking game and some of the aspiring partners that you've brought in? Um, yeah, I, I work on my striking more than anything else. I, um, uh, I do, like, jujitsu three times a week. I wrestle three times a week, and I, I strike six times a week. And it's just, it's where I was the most behind in when I started, and it's where I place the most emphasis now. And, um, well, when I first started, for the first year, my coach had me do only footwork. And, um, then when I started, uh, when I started really working on hands, he had me doing only straight shots. And then it was only late now, like recently, that I've been able to do, you know, hooks and body shots and just mixing it all up and feeling comfortable putting everything together. And I really feel like it's, um, we're finally getting to the part where I feel much more comfortable striking. Great. Thank you. And for Sarah. General, oh, sorry. And for Sarah, how steep of a task is it for you to get into the octagon and prepare for a five-round championship fight after having been out for 10 months? Um, I think that if I had been injured, it probably would have been more difficult. Um, but I've been able to train the entire time, so uh, it doesn't really feel like time off whenever I'm in there going against guys every day. So I'm... I mean, as long as, like, you're still able to come in and go, you know, go really hard and be sharp, it doesn't really feel like time off me. Thank you. And one last question for Rashad Evans, please. Uh, you have Kenny Monday down at the Black Zillions camp. How much has having him uh, down there to help you train and prepare for this fight elevated your wrestling? Uh, Kenny Money is high, you know, he's high level. So, um, you know, anytime you get a chance to train with somebody high level who's been at that Olympic level, um, who can bring some Olympic level training partners down, 
the song was good. So um, having Kenny down has been very, very good help me to for DC. Great. Thank you for the time. We'll take our next question from Damon Martin with FoxSports.com. Uh, thanks, guys. My first question is for Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, this this fight, you know, comes up, and, and literally like a week ago, you get all this announcements about the new movies you're doing, and I know you said it's, uh, you know, you got to put it out of your mind to focus on the fight. Do you, do you kind of wish some of these announcements would get delayed so it would be after the fight, and obviously these kind of questions wouldn't come so close to the fight, or is that just something you've gotten used to? Uh, no, I don't think it's a bad thing that they came before the fight because it helps promote the fight itself. So um, more people will be excited about seeing this fight. And, you know, people that aren't even fight fans, I mean, it was a big news just in, you know, the film business as well. So maybe a lot of more people will be tuning into this fight than normally wouldn't um, just because that news broke out. And for your last fight, you had to do a lot of training in Bulgaria while you're on the set and do a lot of things like that. How much how much did that last training camp kind of mentally and physically prepare you for a short-notice camp like this? I mean, you literally did a big turnaround where you left the Misha fight and got right back into camp. I mean, did that help you? Because I know you had to go through a lot of kind of weird situations to get ready for the Misha fight because of the filming on The Expendables. I've been in a lot of weird situations for a lot of, Situation. I mean, I've been doing this for a really long time. I got some crazy judo stories that prepared me for MMA. And, um, yeah, the the last fight, it was definitely not the optimal training situation. You know, I took pretty much 10 weeks away where I had to figure out ways to stay in shape, and it wasn't really, you know, the optimal training environment. I couldn't spar for 10 weeks. I couldn't do anything like that. I couldn't have my coach there. I just pretty much had to run up mountains and, you know, find grappling partners in Bulgaria and just try to maintain. Whereas I feel like for this fight, I've just been improving the entire time. In the six weeks that I had when I got back to those other movies, I went from, you know, not being in the best shape ever to the best shape of my life. And then I started this camp in the best shape of my life. And uh, because I'd taken all that time off running around and doing movies and all that stuff, that I wasn't exhausted of fighting by the time the uh, last fight was over, you know. I'd only been trained for six weeks, and so I was happy to get back into it. After this fight, on the other hand, I'll, I'll be happy to take a little, little break and, you know, go sit in a makeup trailer for a minute instead. <laughs> And, and Rhonda, you've obviously had a lot of opportunities over the last few years from the day you signed with Strike Force and now. Uh, not trying to get you to talk trash on John Jones, but I don't know if you saw his comment where he said that, you know, you got a lot of opportunities, but UFC's pushing you versus not pushing him. My, my question isn't necessarily about John Jones' comments, but just in your estimation, I mean, how much of this is your own hard work to go out and get these opportunities? And obviously the UFC plays a big part in that, but i got to imagine you got to sit back and appreciate the hard work you put in to, to get to where you're at, being able to do a lot of things outside of fight? Uh, I mean, I don't know exactly what he said, but I work really, really hard. And, you know, I might be getting some help from the UFC now, and I appreciate all their support. But to get to this point, there were a lot of spots where I didn't have any help at all. And so um, I feel like I... I'm owed a little bit of help. God damn it, I had to do so, of it, so much of it alone in the beginning. This is nice. I'm not going to complain about it. They can help me all they want. <laughs> and uh, one question for uh, for DC, Daniel. Uh, obviously, this fight is a huge opportunity for you to jump into the deep end of the 205-pound division. Rashad had said something yesterday where he said that he hates when people ask him about what's next because the only thing that's in front of him is the fight that's actually happening. You've gotten a ton of questions about, you know, John Jones, the title. How much of that has been a distraction, and, and have you had to kind of put that same mindset of saying, stop asking me about that because you need to focus on Rashad? Well, I think a lot of times when you're training to become the champion, you do set your sights on the uh, on the champion. You have to be, you know, you train for the best guy, but as the moment you get a fight, your focus has to change. That guy becomes the obstacle in front of the champion, so... Uh, I've had a laser focus on Rashad Evans, man. That's all we can think about uh, because I know how good he is. If 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 I don't train to fight Rashad Evans, I'm going to get beat. And and then all this talk of what happens next goes completely out the window. Uh, I've trained with Rashad, and I've gotten beat up by Rashad. I know how good the guy is. I I uh, And he's gotten better. So for me to think about what's next, would be doing a disservice to myself, not to not to anyone else, outside of being 
disrespectful to him. I would be cheating myself because I wouldn't give me the right opportunity to eventually get uh, to my ultimate goal. So uh, Rashad Evans is my focus 110%. He has been for the last 10 weeks, and and uh, he's going to be uh, until uh, Saturday night whenever the fight gets over with. Awesome. Thanks very much, guys. And we'll take our next question from Dave Dabert with Post Media News. Hi. Uh, thanks for the time, you guys. Uh, Rhonda, you you touched on this a little bit, but uh, you made no secret coming into uh, the uh, Misha fight that you did get a little burnt out and needed some time away. Um, here, the turnaround is so quick. Was I mean, I think it was announced actually at the press conference that you were uh, you know coming back in two months. Um, was, was there any hesitation in such a quick turnaround or was, you know, were, were you, were you anxious to just, you know, get right back in there after the break away? Uh, well, I didn't find out at the press conference. I found out like three weeks before the Misha fight and, you know, right. and it's pretty much the hardest week of camp. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Dana calls me up and he was like, yo, you want to fight at the end of February? And I was like, honestly? If you need me to do it, I will just want to do it. I will, I will do it for you. But, um, but at the moment, I was thinking about Misha, and um, you know, I'm in my hardest part of the week, and I don't even want to think about another fight that soon. And um, at the press conference um, after the Misha fight, I mean, I was pretty much so amped up after the fight, and um, just the way that the other fight ended, I was super excited to get back in there. And um, so it. You're in a little bit different mindset when you're in the hardest week of camp as opposed to, um, you know, right after the last fight and you're ready to jump back in it again. And um, I, I actually had a phone call with Dana. I, um, I was like, you know, uh, I told him, I'm totally down to do it. Let me call my coach and uh, ask him what he, what he thinks. And um, so I called Edmund up and he was like, you call Dana back and you tell him we'll fuck up any bitch he wants in February. I'm like, all right. So I called back and I gave Dana that exact quote. And, he was pretty stoked about it. And, um, yeah, it's like, it's weird. After every fight, I have a problem where I get back into the gym too quick. Like, it'll be two days after the fight, and I'll be back in the gym, and my coach will be like, what are you doing here? Go home and play Pokemon or something. And um, so I actually took five days off this time, well, away from the gym, not off. And, um, yeah, I was just, I, I can't stay out of the gym. I, I realized that I have nothing else to do. When you really have free time, you keep wanting rest and all this stuff, and then you sit on the couch for two seconds, and you realize that you have nothing else to do, and there's nowhere else to live. You've got your bees in the gym. And uh, going off and doing these movies really made me miss it, and I wanted to get right back in there. All right. I, I asked Sarah this yesterday, and again, you touched on it a little bit, but uh, the, the fact that this is Olympian versus Olympian, you know, that's a storyline that's going to be talked about a fair bit uh, heading into uh, heading into the fight. You know, in in terms of um, you know a, a historical footnote, is that is is that a big deal for you? You know, you've been part of a lot of firsts. Is this a big deal for you, or is it just something that you kind of look at and say, yeah, that's you know that's kind of neat, but you know what whatever. No, it is a really big deal. But the the cool thing about us both being Olympians is that we've both fought a lot of a lot of other Olympians before, hence competing in the Olympics. <laughs> but um, I think yeah, I think it's a really important and cool thing. I guess it's hard to get just as excited for the same goal twice, and so we got to find ways to up the ante every single time to be like, all right, that but this one's even more important. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm super stoked. And uh, it's even better that it's happening, you know, it's, it's coinciding with the Sochi uh, Winter Olympics. And so it just seems like this is the absolute perfect time for it. And I'm super excited. All right, last one for you. If, uh, if you could put on your, uh, your analytical hat for a minute, why, uh, what, what makes the wrestling judo dynamic um, an intriguing one? Like, what, what does judo, you know, how does judo counteract wrestling, and, and why can wrestling, you know, pose pose problems for your judo-based style? Well, I think um, why most wrestlers give uh, judoka issues is no gi. 
but I haven't worn a gi in, in three years. And so I, I'm actually, it, it's funny, whenever anyone actually breaks out a gi and brings it to the gym, I'm like, oh, my God, it's like someone handed a gun to the rock in the rundown, you know? It's like, I forgot I could even use those. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's what poses the most problems. And it's just uh, styles make fights. It's the same thing in, in store and wrestling. You know, there's certain styles of judo that um, – will give other styles fit, and I'm sure that the same is true for wrestling, and so I think a lot depends on the style of wrestling that she has and the style of judo that I have, and uh, there's just so few examples of stuff like that coming together before that I think this is just really, really unique, and neither of us are really going to know how we're going to react with each other uh, until the fight itself happens. All right, that's good stuff. Thanks, Rhonda. No problem. We'll take our next question from Gareth Davies with Daily Telegraph. Good evening, um, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I'm, I'm of course, I'm on the speakerphone on uh, on the on a freeway on the outskirts of London and a very wet, windy, and dark night. Four of the very great. Thank you for the weather uh, report, Gareth. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's minus two, um, and, and it's great to be. Um, have four of the greatest athletes in the world on the phone and four of the greatest people. Uh, in, in, enough of my um, eulogies for now, but first of all, for the ladies. Um, and, and, and Rhonda, first of all. Good evening, Rhonda. Um, just wanted to ask you, um, you know, um, it's, it's well documented how brilliantly you focus kind of spite, if you like, uh, uh, and dislike of someone. We saw it so pointedly in your last performance, and it focused you enormously. How do you do the same kind of focus against a, a woman you obviously respect, who's, who's won a medal like you in the Olympics, and who is clearly coming to take your, or wants to take your title? How do you, how do you switch your focus um, into that kind of demon that you become when you enter the octagon? Um, well... I probably would focus it more on the fans that were booing me last time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they probably right. more in spite of that instead of in spite of her. And um, regardless of how, you know, nice and saintly Sarah is, I mean, I've worked my entire life for everything that I have now. And uh, no matter how, you know, cute and sweet she is, she's still trying to rip away everything that I've ever worked for. And um, that's not very nice. I'm sorry, but... You know, I'm still going to focus just as much as just as important. And so, um, yeah, it, it's still easy for me to find ways to focus. I mean, I, I, I live with girls that are my division. We'll, we'll still find ways to focus and fight each other um, if it ever comes down to it, too. You know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to actually dislike the person. It's not that I feel angry when I walk into the octagon. It's that I just have to empty myself of emotion. And I'm going to be doing that when I fight there, too. Uh, just a final question, Rhonda, about, um, can you put it in context? Obviously, there's a lot being spoken at the moment about your athletic career allied with your, your um, Hollywood career, if you like, if I can call it that. But um, how much is acting um, a hobby and fun for you, if I can put it that way, in comparison to what your athletic life is at the moment? How, how do you... How do you um, how, how do you um, explain them? Is one is one just a developing interest, and one the one that you're actually in and more committed to? Uh, yeah, you said it pretty uh, pretty succinctly. Uh, I think that I'm really just I, I'm a fighter. That's why even anyone in Hollywood is interested in me at all. I mean, that's really what I am. And um, I all the advice that I've gotten about acting is just like don't take it too seriously. I mean, you're just playing. You're, you're really just making right. stuff up, and uh, we were supposed to be having fun. And, uh, yeah, I think last night uh, I decided to, to hone my acting skills. <laughs> we just do it like a game. Like, uh, we went to go swimming, and uh, my coach took me to swimming, and the lady was, like, checking in the system. It's like, oh, you were born on such and such date, right? And then he was like, don't give my, you know, don't, sh sh don't give my birthday away. And I was like, what? You're not 28? Like, I started getting like, really serious about it. I was like, I told my mother you were 28. Like, I started just going off on this whole tangent. I wanted to see how long I could hold it. And then um, the other day, uh, what's it called? We had everybody over at the house, and then Jessamine, when she was up there sleeping, 
And uh, my uh, my coach is a little bit eccentric, right? So so be lazy. And my coach are downstairs. They're like, yo, let's wake Jessamyn up and tell her that uh, that Edwin's in a bad mood, and we have to all get up and trade at midnight. And I was like, all right, all right. So I was like, okay, let me get all assy on all you guys. And so I had to run upstairs. I was like, Jessamyn, man. And when in one of his moods, you got to get up. This isn't the first time it's happened. He, we got to go do a midnight training at the beach right now. She's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm serious. Lazy's trying to film and he's cracking up in the hallway. So I'm like, hone, hone the acting. I'm like, don't break character. I'm like, Jessamine, seriously, we got to go. And then Edmund starts running from the bottom of the stairs. I've been waiting out here for a half hour already. So we just start, like, messing with each other and trying to actually, like, yeah, this pranks and uh, stuff like that. I consider that acting. We just play around. It really is like a hobby and something fun. Well, I'm always out here whenever you want to practice your lines. Yeah, I'm bookable. Um, um, does the, thank you very much, Ron. Sarah, um, I, I, I wanted to ask, um, uh, again, I'm so delighted that you're you're getting the title shot. I can't wait to see you step against Ronda. Um, what, um, what do you make of the theory that one of the reasons why the title shot has come so quickly again in seven weeks is that there's a theory going around in a sense that, you know, better for Ronda to face you now than in a year and a half's time when you could be much more dangerous in terms of taking her title away. What do you make of that theory that, that perhaps the thinking is in her camp that it will take you early rather than too late? Um... I don't, I don't know. I hadn't really heard that theory, but uh, I think it's more because it's at the same time as the Olympics, so I think it's more of a, a PR move to have those two coincide so the people who are paying attention to the Olympics want to also pay attention to two Olympians. But um, I, it's, it kind of doesn't really make sense because the more time I'm given, the more time she's given. The more time I have to get better, the more time she has to get better. So that... I don't know. I'm not really into conspiracy theories, but you I think that's that really. Yeah. I'm sorry. And, and yeah, no, no. Sorry, I interrupted you. I'm sure the line's not great, but um, the, the, the other thing I wanted to ask you uh, was, you know, um, when we did an interview uh, some time ago now, you, you, you mentioned that um, your daughter comes first. This is all all about the ultimate athletic test. It's not about making a living. You could go and live in a field. In, in, in a yurt, in a tent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, yeah I, you remember saying that now, yeah? I'm, I'm, I'm sure yeah. it's true. Um, but having been in the sports longer now as well, um, how important do you believe, like Ronda, to set a marker down that women can come from the combat sports in the Olympics where you earn a lot of money and you can come and make a living for yourselves as fully-fledged professional um combat fighters um, as women because it is a very new thing for women to be able to make good money as fighters no I think that this is like a, a different time in women's MMA you know and a lot of people have come before us kind of setting this you know the stage for this to happen and I think that it's a very real thing um, I encourage other girls at different weight classes to uh, to step into MMA if they're closer to the end of their wrestling career or, you know, like any uh, jiu-jitsu girls that I train with, I'm like, you know, I think that you can. You can do it and you can continue to do combat sports. You can continue to do it professionally and, and make a living out of it. And, you know, like that sets up your, your family for the future. I mean, I do it for different reasons, but the rest of us come from sports where you don't really make any money. You're just, you know, doing it because of love of doing it. But at some point, you know, when you have to work full time and you have a family, like you can't do all those things. You just, there's just not enough hours in the day. So if you can do what you love to do and train professionally, then, and then spend time with your family, that's, you know, that's an awesome rare thing to be able to do. And we'll take our next question from Dave Meltzer with MMAfighting.com. Okay. Um, first on um, for Daniel, um, you know, in your in your previous fights, you've been fighting mainly like really big guys, guys like you know Bigfoot and Frank Mir that are a lot bigger than you, and you've been able to use your speed in those fights. And with Rashad, by far, you're going to be going against the fastest guy that you've ever had a professional fight with. Um, I mean, is there anything different that you've done in training? You know, knowing that that speed's going to be a, a much a much different factor this time. 
Well, I mean, you know, Rashad's a, Rashad's a very fast fighter, as you said. And, um, you know, I've, I've fought smaller guys, uh, guys that are a little faster. The, the issue becomes fighting a guy that's fast but can also wrestle like Rashad can wrestle. You know, that's, that's where it becomes an issue. Not many guys uh, that are fast striking guys are as good uh, and complete as a wrestling. So I've had to kind of change some of those things. I've done a lot more speed and agility. Uh, I, I got a strength and conditioning coach, do a lot of stuff outside to, to work on my footwork and my speed. I think that's going to be the biggest challenge overall going down to 205. So uh, in that sense, I've done that. But, you know, I've, I've trained with, with fast guys before. And, and uh, I, again, I, I'm going to get faster myself, being that I'm going down a weight class too and, and losing weight. When I wrestled 185 in college, I was just as fast as the guys I competed against because that was the weight I was at. So. I don't anticipate the speed being as big an advantage as people think it's going to be. Um, I mean, as far as from a stylistic standpoint, when you look at that division, I mean, do you, do you think the Rashad's the most difficult stylistically for you or just one of them or, or, or one of the more difficult or, or just, or just another, I mean, just another top 180, I mean, 205 pound guy. 100% most difficult fight for me in this division. There isn't a guy in this division that presents the problems that Rashad Evans will present to me because of his ability to wrestle his speed, and his explosive power, man. Rashad has good power, you know, but he's not just punching guys and knocking them out. You know, when Rashad really does explode into a punch and he really does put everything behind it, I mean, he's knocking them unconscious, you know. So uh, it's that explosiveness that uh, that 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 I really have to worry about, uh, not just his hand speed. I mean, he can stand there throwing fast, uh, soft punches all day, and, and I can probably just – just take him. But it's when he explodes and really sets down on his punches uh, that presents the issues. And then his ability to wrestle. You know, people forget that uh, in college, Rashad beat one of the best wrestlers of all time in Greg Jones. You know, he beat the guy. The guy lost only two or three times in his whole entire career. And one of those matches was to Rashad Evans. So, uh, you know, I watched him wrestle Chris Pendleton, who was another uh, NCAA great to, to double overtime matches. So, uh, Rashad's a very difficult guy to wrestle with which makes him uh, most dangerous to me. The rest of the guys, I can probably just run across the cage and take him down. <laughs> you know, and for, for Rashad, you know, I mean, Daniel just brought up your, your wrestling, which, you know, I mean, everybody was really impressed when you, when you fought Phil Davis and out-wrestled him for five rounds. Um, I mean, when you look back on your – what's the difference between your wrestling in MMA and your wrestling in college? Because, I mean, you had some big wins and impressive performances, but at the same time, you know, I mean, you were you were not a – you know, you you went to the NCAA's, but you never had that big tournament like Daniel had, and 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 some of the other guys like Phil Davis had. I mean, what's what is, is there a mental difference or a, or a, a training difference, or or just the sports better for you with, with, with the mixing and the strikes than than just pure wrestling? I think it uh, comes along for me uh, more athletic maturity. You know, uh, being in in a sport which allows me to use my assets and my strength to the fullest extent. You know, I feel like in wrestling. It's like I never really, um, really got into my groove, you know. And it could be mental, it could be physical, but whatever the case may be, I didn't get into it. And uh, but I feel like with fighting, you know, the biggest difference, uh, what makes you know wrestling so much different than than fighting is, is the fact that you know you have the transition, you have the strikes, and you know you have a lot of people who are really good in wrestling on paper, but when it comes to putting their uh, ones and twos together with their shots. They're pretty remedial with their takedowns, and they really can't do too much. You know, everybody's making a big deal about this fight, about it being such a wrestling match. You know, to be honest, these seeing that you know, people try to put me against the cage and wrestle me and take me down. So, you know, I mean, you know, he ain't gonna, he ain't gonna get nothing in the center of the cage. You know that, I know that. So, all it just comes down to just walling and brawling. And uh, for uh, for Ronda and Sarah, I mean, you're you know, you're both going against you know a world class athlete from a, another sport. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, you both trained in that other sport now, especially, and, and even before, I mean, for, for, I guess that's Ronda first. Um, what have you learned from training wrestling? Um, you know, I mean, is there any, any certain things in training wrestling that surprised you or that, um, you know, you've, you've learned that, okay, this is, this is a, you know, some really interesting stuff that I can, you know, have to learn to defend or, or maybe even can implement on offense myself. Uh, I mean, like I was completely foreign to wrestling up to this point. I mean, there are a lot of fouls in judo that are pretty much entirely wrestling based that I've been doing ever since I was a kid. 
Um, I think the main thing what I had to deal with was when I first started doing MMA years ago, I was just getting used to there being no handles on people. And um, I, I think that's when I realized that with, with no gi, I can actually move a lot faster and change from one position to another quicker. And um, I have a really fast thought process when it comes to, you know, grappling and on the ground. And you can take more risks because if you end up in a bad position in a gi, you're more stuck in that position. Whereas in no gi, it's like you do have more room here and you can be a little bit more risky. And um, you can go for, you know, more exciting and fun stuff. And uh, I think it was just really getting used to fighting with no gi on. And that's really the only difference between wrestling and judo, in my opinion, besides... um, you know, there's, there's philosophies and stuff in judo that uh, wrestling doesn't have. So usually what I try to say is the difference is in wrestling, the the throws that you do that require a lot of strength, that's the wrestling throw. And the throws that you do that happen effortlessly, those are the judo throws. And so um, I really believe that they're, they're very, very much the same. And um, I've been really training in, in wrestling for an extremely long time. And for, uh, for for Sarah, I mean, I guess in a sense this would be, you know, because without the gi, a lot of the judo technique would be would be different anyway, and it is closer to wrestling. But I mean, what have you, as far as like, I, I would presume you've trained with some judo people to to get ready for her. I mean, what have you learned about the judo, and and do you feel that your base and you know your your base would be able to block most of her throws because um, you know you've got the balance from all those years of wrestling. Um. I think I've learned uh, more to cross over to wrestling. Things aren't, you know, I mean, to cross over to MMA, things aren't necessarily wrestling throws, and they aren't necessarily judo throws. Just the MMA aspect really does change uh, what it is because you have different threats. So, um, you know, like the things that people would do in judo, like sometimes you have to, you just have to be careful and aware of different things, but it, it's the same exact way with wrestling. Like I can, she can only bring a portion of judo over to MMA effectively. I can only bring a portion of wrestling over, you know, and I, it's the same thing I learned when I was transferring over my wrestling skills to MMA. And we'll take our next question from Ken Tishna with MMAweekly.com. Hey, guys. Uh, this question's for Sarah. Um, Sarah, mm-hmm. uh, Rhonda said that you were probably her biggest challenge to date. And she's given a lot of respect to you, um, especially for your Olympic background. How much does your background, um, having been through the Olympic process, how much does that did that play into your success in mixed martial arts and particularly in preparing for Ronda? I, I don't know if it was um, necessarily the my Olympic success that it has, because I, I think you could take other Olympians or, you know, like Olympic medalists and, and sometimes that doesn't translate into success in another sport. So um, I think part of it is, you know, each individual. And that's why when I began in MMA, I was like, you know, maybe I'll like to this and maybe I'll take to it and maybe it'll be something I enjoy, but maybe it won't. So I kind of gave myself a little bit of time to say, you know, if I, if I don't like this, if it's something I don't take to or I'm just, if I'm really just bad at it, then, you know, I'll just be okay with my, my wrestling career. But you know, and then sometimes you take to it and, you know, it's really fun. So I think that um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean, like, if you are an Olympian, if you are high level at a certain sport, that you will necessarily automatically be good at a different sport that's similar. Right. But uh, I guess what I'm asking for more is um, the mental side of it. Having competed at that level, especially in a competition that comes around once every, you know, four years and where this might be your only shot. At, at competing at that level, um, you know, it doesn't come around every day. Uh, does that prepare you more mentally for the challenges that you face, especially now that you're in the UFC and fighting in front of all the spotlights? Um, I don't know if it, uh, it prepares me more like it, it reveals me, you know, like, uh, because, by the time that I had competed in my first world championships or, you know, like had competed in the Olympics, I had never done it before. So um, really it just revealed to me that when it is the big pressure situation, when it is every four years, when we never have the opportunity again, I do what I've been trained to do. So 
if that makes sense. Like, I don't look at it, and I'm not necessarily like, oh, because I did this before, you know, it automatically will have something. But I can, I can trust it that whenever the pressure comes on, I show up. Okay, thanks. And for Rhonda, um, kind of leading into that same thing, you know, you said that, that Sarah was your biggest challenge to date, and you've mentioned her Olympic experience. But uh, I think Sarah right there just saying that, um, you know, for this opportunity that came around once in a lifetime, once every four years or whatever, she steps up. Is that what what you see in her that makes her so dangerous is that she does when the pressure is there, when all the pressure in the world is on her, she steps up? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I was meaning before is that if you're not, if you're an Olympic medalist, you, you have already proved that you can perform in a high pressure situation. You know, there's, there's a term that we use in, in judo, we call them dojo fighters, the people that they fight really, really well, you know, when they're in the gym or if it's some whatever tournament and they'll, they'll be, you know, world champions and Olympians on the, at the, uh, the tournaments that don't matter. But when it gets to the point when it does matter, they um, they fight below themselves. And uh, I think that being a silver medalist, Sarah's already proved that in a high-pressure situation, she fights above herself. All right, thank you. And real quick for uh, Rashad, you know, this is Daniel's first fight coming down to light heavyweight, but he's a little unique in that he was a top five, easily top five heavyweight, you know, before he made the move down. What... What do you feel a victory over Daniel, even, you know, what does that do for your career at this point? Is, is a win over somebody making their heavyweight debut with the credentials that Daniel has, does that mean um, a lot for your career and keeping you at, at the top of the division, do you think? I mean, I was fighting Daniel, I was fighting somebody who has no name. Winning is always important, it's always the most important thing, so... Um, it really doesn't matter, to be honest. Uh, you know, who I'm fighting, I just need to win. And, um, you know, like I said, I mean, you know, a big deal is made about, oh, you just pass this guy, you get to fight for the title. None of that shit even matters, to be honest, man. You know, I just go on there and focus on this fight. Do this fight, it doesn't matter if I'm fighting Daniel or anybody else, I just need to win. And real. And we'll take our next question from Kel Dancy with CSO. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, first question is for Rhonda. Rhonda, how does training with someone as good as Marina help prepare you for these fights and uh, the upcoming challenges? How is training with who? Marina? Can you repeat the question? Yes. How does training with Marina? Yeah, help you prepare for your upcoming fights and your challenges. Um, well, having Marina to train with and, um, just all, you know, Justin and Angie, all of us, our whole group, we, we really help motivate each other and, um, we help keep each other excited to go to the gym. I mean, it's such a difference now that in the beginning or I just had to like sit on the couch and just, you know, there's some days where you just have to like convince yourself to move and, you know, you sometimes there's some days you just have to drag yourself to practice and you just sit there on the floor of five just sweating your eyes off and you're like, oh my God. And it's something you really have to force yourself to sometimes and I think having uh, Marina and the girls next to me, it just, it makes us all a joy and it makes us all feel so enthusiastic and so like, um, happy and motivated and I think as Mike Tyson said that a happy fighter is a dangerous fighter and Marina keeps me very dangerous. All right. And you said you touched on it before. You said there might come a day where you might have to fight one of the people you train with. Uh what would go into that? Do you guys discuss that regularly while training or is that something in the future that you don't even worry about? Oh, we talk about all the time, especially me and Shayna. We talk about all the shit that we've been talking to, to each other in the interviews. We talk about, like, how what the tagline for the posters would be. Uh, yeah, we, we actually, we're, we're pretty well prepared for when it does go down. And um, and we know what it is. We, like, what's one of the reasons why we all get along so well is that we, all the same things are important to us. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, if there was to be anyone to succeed me to my belt, it, it would I would be happy that I'd be one of them. 
All right, thanks, Rhonda. Uh, Sarah, being such an underdog in this fight, is that something that motivates you coming into it? Is it something that fueled you during training camp? Uh, I don't really think about it. Um, it doesn't really change things one way or another because, I don't know, I just never did in wrestling either, so it's just a natural habit that I carried over that I just go in thinking about how I feel about it. I'm kind of self-centered like that. <laughs> Oh, that's a great quality to have. All right, thanks, Sarah. Uh, last question for uh, Daniel. Uh, do you consider this fight, uh, I, I guess, a, a qualifying fight for the title? Is this kind of winner gets the shot at John Jones next type of match? Is that something you or Rashad can answer this as well? Do you think this is a number one contender type of match? You know, man, it's uh, it's it's one of those situations where. You you hope you hope it, it leads to that. You know, I I uh, if I can beat Rashad, that'll be fourteen and zero, man, with three former champions on my resume. Uh, but you know, UFC seems to want to do Gustafson. You know, I I think the whole thing is uh, if I can get through Rashad, uh, I'll beat Jones. And how much better would it be to promote a fight where he's trying to get his belt back rather than promoting him fighting a guy that just fought him close? No, that's, that's very true. Uh, since you brought that up, would it be another possibility that's been sprinkled out there but hasn't been talked to a lot is Jones wants to go up and fight for the heavyweight championship. Would you consider letting him go up, vacating the title, you beat Stockton, getting the belt, and then doing a, a combined match? Like, a, he's heavyweight, he's been to heavyweight, you're down there, two belts, one night type of situation. Well, this is the thing. Again, you know, I always say this, man. Like, this whole John Jones thing has kind of been blown out of proportion. I care about being a champion. So if John decides to go to heaven, he can go up there and get beat up by Kane. That's the only thing that's going to happen. Because there won't, there won't, it won't ever be a, uh, a two-belt thing because I don't think any of these guys are going to beat Velasquez. So uh, if he leaves, then, you know, if he was to leave the division, I wish he would have did it already so that the only reason I'd have to fight Rashad is for the title. But didn't work out that way, so if he left, I'd fight whoever had the belt if I can if I can win on February twenty second. Uh Rashad, how much does winning the belt pack mean to you at this point in your career? Rashad Rashad's gone. Rashad, are you still on the line? Oh, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh you know winning oh, the belt means everything. Okay. You hear me? Yeah, I got you. you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Winning the belt means everything, you know. Um, just to compete in the sport is, you know, the ultimate goal is to be a champion. And anything you can do to, uh, you know, be champion right now is, is the, you know, the most important thing to to stay focused on is that belt. So it really mean a lot, you know, because um, having the belt before, not being able to represent it the way I wanted to, uh, definitely you know, left a lot inside of me that I want to still accomplish. So. Uh, you know, I'm just making a climb, and, you know, D.C. is the way to there, but, you know, for me, I'm just really focused on D.C. right now. Due to time constraints, we will take our final question from Wade Eck with MMA Heat. Hi, yes. Um, I just had a question for all of you guys, actually. Um, yesterday, the UFC announced that they're going to be uh, doing away with the submission of the night and fight of the night bonuses. They're going to be replacing that with performance bonuses. Uh, there'll be two performance bonuses awarded to the fighter that uh, uh, gives an outstanding performance during their fight. Um, I'm just curious of what you guys thought about that. This is questions for anyone. Why don't we just go ahead and, uh, Daniel, why don't you take that question first, and we'll go Daniel, Rashad, Sarah, Rhonda. Uh, you know what, man? It, it, I haven't really, I've never gotten a bonus, so I don't even know if that even applies to me. Uh, so I just go out there and fight the best that I can. You know, I, I would love a bonus, but my fight purses are, are more than, uh, they're, they're, they're fine for me. You know, I, I won't cross that bridge until I get there. I really have no opinion of it, actually. And, and I, I didn't. I forgot to mention that they're going to remain at fifty thousand dollars. So in addition to the fight of the night bonus of fifty thousand, there will now be two fifty thousand dollar performance bonuses. Yeah, I feel like I again. I, I really don't have much of an opinion on it because you yeah. know we cross that bridge and we get there, know. man. Got you. 
Uh, Rashad, did did that change your strategy at all, or did you just do the same fight you'd always do? No, it means absolutely nothing to me. I don't care either way. Okay. Um, Rhonda, do you have an opinion? Ooh, I thought you said I was last. You forgot your own order. But, I, I didn't uh, think you were did. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, <babe. laughs> uh, It's all good. It's all good. Um, I mean, honestly, I never go in there thinking, like, I'm going to go get this bonus tonight. I mean, I go in there thinking about winning, and I always want to win in the most exciting way possible. And uh, whether that, you know, I, you know, the only thing that sucks is I think it'll be harder to get a double bonus now, you know, because you can't get right. fire of the night and a performance of the night, but you can't get fire of the night and submission of the night. I found that out, but, um, you know, that's, that's the only thing that I think is really going to change. I think they just want to encourage the fighters to go out there and have exciting matches, you know, and uh, if they think that this will help, then, you know, it's, it's their business to see if it works. But, um, yeah, um, I, I would miss not having the opportunity to get a double bonus anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and lastly, Sarah, uh, fifty thousand dollars uh, performance bonus. Is that uh, doing anything different for your strategy? No, um, it doesn't change anything for me. But um, it probably will open up uh, some different aspects for other fighters. Like, say, if you only have one knockout, knockout on the card, I mean, then that obviously would get knockout of the night. But if you open it up to be performance of the night. You know, like, it really opens it up to anybody who does something, you know, spectacular or, you know, like, something that people can talk about or something really, you know, like, great. You know, you don't have to choose between getting fight of the night if somebody else might have it, you know, and then have to give it more to the person who gets a knockout, whether it was, like, spectacular or not, which usually they are, but, you know. Sure. If there's only one submission on the card, but if you say performance of the night, you can really give it to the people who go out there and put on a great show. Right. Well, all four of you always give outstanding performances, so um, uh, I, I guess it probably wouldn't change your game plan. Uh, thank you guys for your time. Thank you, Wade. And that, that will uh, conclude today's media call. Before we depart, just want to remind everybody of the schedule. Next week, Wednesday, February 9th, things kick off at the Mandalay Bay Event Center on the arena floor with a free open-to-the-public event. It's open workout. Rousey McMahon, Evans, and Cormier, we start things off at 1 o'clock. Thursday, another public event, the press conference that's going to be taking place at Mazuya at Mandalay Bay. Dana, Rousey, McMahon, Evans, Cormier, McDonald, and Maya will participate. That starts at 1 o'clock. Just a reminder, new episode of Tough tonight on Fox Sports 1 at 10 p.m. Eastern. And then this weekend from Brazil, it's Machida versus Musasi, the five-round middleweight bout with huge title implications. That starts at 10.30 Eastern. Thanks to everybody for joining us today. We will see you next week in Las Vegas. And if you're traveling to Brazil, safe travels, everybody. Have a good day. This now concludes the presentation. Thank you for your participation.